All right, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you all to our 2020 annual membership meeting. I'm very excited to have you all joining us today and to be able to share with you some of the highlights from our year. And to get us started, I wanted to share with you our mission. We are the Missouri Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and our mission is to unite Missourians with the shared value that rape and abuse must end. And we advance this mission through our core services of education, alliance, research, and public policy. And a little bit later, I'll be giving our operations report through the lens of our four core service areas. Before we get started though, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about the logo that we have specifically for our 40th year anniversary. Foundations focus future. As we were talking at the beginning of the year about how we really wanted to be able to build a lot of excitement and momentum within our membership about our 40 year anniversary and conference, we wanted to try and identify a few things that were really important to us as a coalition. One of those is recognizing the foundation on which we were built, that we were and still are in many ways a grassroots movement that was started out of caring and concerned and passionate individuals who didn't wanna see women and children and their families affected by violence any longer. Looking at where we are now, we still have that strong focus and we wanna make sure that we are nurturing and caring for all of the advocates at our member agencies. We are still very focused on this mission. And as we look toward the future, we also look towards new innovative and inclusive ways of providing these services, not only to our members, but really looking at how you all are able to move this work forward in your communities too. So looking at the way that violence and oppression at the intersections affect all people in our communities. You all are doing really inclusive and innovative work. We're reaching more people than ever. And we also have a really strong focus on preventing violence before it ever occurs. And we felt like that was such an important thing to share with everyone, that we are built on a strong foundation. We are very focused on staying connected to one another and we're working toward a more equitable and inclusive future for all of us. So I wanna also uh, uh, let you know who will be speaking today. Cheryl Rob Welch is going to uh, be kicking us off in just a moment. Cheryl is our chief operating officer and she will be providing an overview of our board as well as our financials. I am Matthew Huffman, our public affairs director and I will be giving an update on the coalition's operations over the last year. And Heidi Coleman is our member services specialist and she will be providing uh, a very fun update at the end of the call on our 40th anniversary winner of our swag. So with that, I am now going to turn it over to Cheryl. Good morning. As Matthew said, I'm Cheryl Rob Welch. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of your coalition. And so we're really pleased to be able to give you a report on what we've been doing this past year and a quick snapshot on what we probably are going to be doing for you next year. So. Matthew alluded to that we had started in 1980, and so this is our 40th anniversary, and I wanted to really focus on the areas of growth that we have gone through in that 40 years. So as Matthew said, it started with a small core group of programs that were 14 of you in the state of Missouri that helped create the coalition that is now 124 members strong. So each of our states and territories have coalitions and Missouri is by and large one of the biggest in the nation. So we're really pleased with the number of members and the advocacy that you all have done in order to continue to broaden the number of services that we have in our state. So with that, and in those 40 years, when we were originally established, we were established on basically wanting to provide three core services to you, which was public policy, so you have a voice in legislative work, technical assistance, so that there's a core area that you can go to and a core service group that has information to share and alliance building. Because with that, when you come into regional meetings and share the information on how that you've been doing services, you're helping others advance the work in their communities on how they do our, theirs. 
And then finally on training. And so those are gonna be some of the things that we report out to you because when we were founded 40 years ago with a commitment to provide those services, 40 years later, those are still the core services that we're committed to providing for you. So in 2005, the board of directors underwent um, an analysis and a look at our board structure. And at the time, and for that entire period, we had been basically a membership board of members who were constituents. And so there was an idea that there was some changes that were going on across the nation and a recognition that if we invited community members into our boards and into our organizations, that they could help us advance the work in areas that we had only thought about. So on the next slide, it gives you an idea of what happened in 2005. And in that, we're waiting for slides to advance. One moment, please. Thank you. <laughs> so, and in that, when the board moved to having community members, within 2006, we had already populated the board with them. And so we've reorganized some of our committees. And so you have your standard executive committee, a finance committee and board development committee, as I'm sure most of you also have. We also have a public policy committee that has a robust membership that includes both board members and members from local programs. And then finally, our membership committee that is comprised of members. So in the membership committee, there's a focus in looking at making sure that the services that we provide meet your needs and looking at how and when service standards need to be updated in order to stay abreast of the changing services and the ways that you all are doing your work. That is by your peers and for your peers that that committee stands. So to introduce you just to some of our 2020 board members, instead of reading everything, I'll assume that you can do that. Um, but I will highlight that Brendan Cosette is our current chair of our board and serves as the chief operating officer of the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And then we also have our full executive committee that also includes Ian Chang, our vice chair, who's a loan officer at US Mortgage, Julie Donnellan, who is with Moxa in Kansas City and serves as our treasurer, and Susan Miller, who's the CEO of Rosebrook Center and serves as our secretary. And then we have two new incoming members that are also listed on there, Narcissa Perjul and Pamela Sison. So Jessica Wolbright, we're gonna talk about in a moment when we start talking about the membership committee, serves as that committee's chair, and then it is rounded out with Cynthia Copeland, Jessica Hill, Molly Jones, and Jeremy Lefebvre, and finally Phyllis Miller at the YW in St. Louis. So those board members have helped us figure out how to advance our work and inform our public policy also. And so, as I said, we have a really large public policy committee, and these are some of those members. And currently it is chaired by Mary Ann Allen, who is this executive director at Haven House and also on this call. So hello, Mary Ann, and thank you for your service. <laughs> so that is the list of your public policy. So you can always contact our public policy director, Jennifer Carter Dockler at the office. You can contact Colleen Coble, our CEO, who is at the office as well, or you can contact Mary Ann Allen if you have concerns, questions, or anything else. You can also feel free to contact any of these folks in order to share your concerns about any legislative or public policy issues that are up and coming. And then finally, our membership committee that we talked about, which is made up of your peers and is chaired by Jessica Woolbright, also has a vice chair of Laura Halfman Morris. And then the rest of our committee, you also can contact if you have any questions about service provision or anything that the coalition is doing in order to provide you services. So that covers everybody who's involved in the leadership of our organization in some way and then we move into the highly stimulating area of the annual meeting which is to cover our, our financial position so in 2019 because our annual meeting also focuses on the year prior because that is our audited year we're going to cover 2019 financials and then we'll give you some overview of the 2020 um, unaudited financial information so our 2019, we actually did have an annual audit that was classified as being an unqualified, which in accounting language is, is one of the highest thresholds that you can pass on an audit. And so we're really pleased that we had another year with an unqualified audit. And in that year, um, many of you who have had VOCA grants are finding that you've been tipped over into the scale where you're looking at having to do single point audits or A133 audits, which holds a higher threshold of scrutiny. We actually had two of those this year. We qualified for not only having our VOCA funds being audited in a single point and a higher level of analysis than a standard audit, but also our Department of Justice grant that funds us as a coalition. 
and we passed both of those also with unqualified standards. So our budget in 2019 was $2.1 million. And as of the end of 2019, MCA DSV had a net worth of $1.4 million. So if we look at how we break down the budget in 2019 and how that that was spent, you can see that we used 90% of our funding and resources in order to provide programming for you all. So that means 90% of our revenue went back into providing training, technical assistance and public policy work on your behalf. We spent 9% on management in general, and 1% was on fundraising, which in our world and in our classification, fundraising is grant writing. So that's where we spent our resources and how we spent them. So 2019 also saw yet another audit for us. So not only did we undergo an annual funding audit, but we also had our first in as far back as any of us can remember, if ever, we had a federal funder who did a site visit with us and the state of Missouri in order to talk about the Family Violence and Prevention and Services Act funding that we get. And so we received direct funding from Department of Health and Human Services in, in by way of a FIPSA grant. Um, when we underwent that audit, they looked at everything from the types of services we provide, our bylaws, all of our guiding documents and operating procedure manuals, did interview with staff and worked with the state of Missouri and interviewed some of our board members, our membership committee members, and a handful of our members to find out what kind of work are we doing on your behalf. So I'm pleased to say that we've already received the results and it had one finding. And that finding, when we were informed of it, we were able to contact them immediately and said, yeah, that finding that had an error in our STERA standards of a number, we've already worked on changing that and that's going to be issued. So our finding was pretty much erased at the moment that they issued it. So we're very pleased that over the course of so many years of not having a federal funder come and visit us, that they found us to be an exceptional coalition. So we were really pleased with the results of our 2019 audits, both financial and for services. So if we move forward into our uh, 2020 financials, we have a budget this year of $2.1 million. And as of October 31st, which I also double checked as, our, uh, as of November 31st, we've only spent approximately 82% of our budget. So with COVID, we had to redo and change the landscape of how we provide services. And so we were able actually to save money in a few ways because we weren't traveling because we were meeting virtually in a variety of other ways. So we've been underspending our budget, which means that we have moved from, um, I checked and in 2019, we had months reserve available to us at about two and a half. Two and a half months would have sustained us and that was it. Because when we purchased the building a number of years ago, we depleted a number of our reserves and we've been working on building those up ever since. And so I'm pleased to say that while we were at 2.47 in 2019, we moved to a full four months as of 2020. And so internally, we've established a goal of trying to come up with six months of reserve to put us back in sort of more of a stability that we feel like that we need to have. And based on the amount of growth that we have, we're fully expecting that we can probably hit that 6% by the end, or not 6%, apologies, six months by the end of next year. So we're pretty excited about that because we do have a goal that each year we are setting aside funds in order to go back into the organization and support us. Should we have issues with any grants that are slow in being received, slow in contract awards, as so many of you know, all of those things that you have to plan for, those are the things that we've been planning for in order to maintain services as you have expected them to be. And so with that, because we've put so much effort into making sure that our financials and our funds have been spent on providing services to you, one of the ways that we did that, and we're gonna highlight next as I hand this off to Matthew, is that we provided training to 5,000 advocates this year. And that was at the end of October. And so we've not even finished the year. We've not finished the number of offerings that we're providing for you. And we're looking at continuing to grow that amount. So Matthew is going to tell you more about the operations piece of the organization and how that we've been working to support your needs. So again, if you have any questions, Matthew is going to provide information on how you can contact us at the end of it. Feel free to call me and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. So Matthew, if you want to continue on with talking about our education efforts. Absolutely. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I do want to highlight and again, just amplify what Cheryl had mentioned is that so far this year, as of the end of November, 
we have trained 5,117 advocates. And uh, that is an increase from 2019 by 425. I think that that is particularly exciting for the majority of all of us at the coalition, not just the folks on staff who are organizing these trainings and providing them, but for all of you, because this shows that not only do we at the coalition really value professional development, but so do you all. You really value the service that we provide. So in our statewide series, we have held 30 events so far this year and have trained 1,003 advocates in that statewide series. Through our Directors Academy, we've held 11 events and trained 122 advocates. Through a variety of leadership courses this year, both for um, uh, senior level leadership as well as mid-managers, we have held 21 events and trained 585 advocates. We also, even in the midst of a pandemic, are still providing on-site trainings for our member agencies. And we have held eight of those so far and trained 92 advocates at our member agencies. Jumping down to our online training, we're very excited to announce that this year we've been able to expand the amount of online trainings we offer. We have 23 courses currently available and 2,126 advocates have participated and been trained through those. Jumping back up to our community trainings, we have held 10 events and trained 409 community members. Those are our allied professionals who we really value their partnership and the work that we do alongside them. One particular one that I do wanna highlight is our ongoing work with AmeriCorps St. Louis and Mission St. Louis. They have been our partners the last couple of years as we've been developing our preventing harassment in the workplace training and toolkit. We're very excited to have been able to work with them and they've really helped us to refine that training and curriculum and move it forward. So those are just a few of the people we work alongside out in the community as well. Looking at our other core area of alliance, this year, we've been able to hold many events to bring together advocates from our member agencies, as well as other allied professionals. So this year, we have brought together 521 advocates for 37 regional meetings, many of those held right here over Zoom, and still being able to have folks connected and supporting one another. Additionally, we brought together 78 advocates of color for 10 people of color gatherings one that will even be held later today after this meeting. So we definitely encourage the participation in all of these events to make sure that folks are able to stay connected to one another. We brought together 80 advocates and allied professionals for two immigrant and refugee services roundtables. We also brought together 57 prevention advocates for seven prevention capacity building cohorts and 44 advocates for five sexual assault capacity building cohort sessions. We've been able to run these two capacity building cohorts this year, again, in the midst of a pandemic. And I think that these numbers really speak to the level of commitment and dedication that you all have. You all wanna stay connected to us and to each other, and we wanna make sure we provide that opportunity for all of you. I now wanna recognize our regional liaisons. Our regional liaisons are the folks who serve on our membership committee, but they provide a really important role for us in keeping this alliance piece a central part of our work. So in Northwest, we have Ann Gosnell. For Kansas City, we have Victoria Pickering. For our Southwest region, Sharon Alexander. In our Central region, we have Dr. Stephanie Logan. For Northeast, Michelle Goon. In St. Louis, we have Jessica Woolbright. And in Southeast region, we have Kim Dixon. These folks have been instrumental this year in really helping us keep a pulse on what's happening in each region of the state. And they serve as a really vital leadership connection between our staff and all of our member agencies, especially as we look at developing content for regional meetings. A couple things that we wanted to make sure and highlight for you all that came out of our membership committee this year. Our membership committee always works really hard to provide MCA DSV staff with guidance on training topics 
and public policy implementation through their reports on service trends and their respective regions. This year, those service trends really centered on how domestic and sexual violence agencies adjusted their policies, procedures, and services in order to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Alongside that, the membership committee representatives spent a lot of time this year working on updating the committee's policies and procedures, job description, term limits, and nomination form. So they did a lot of really strong internal capacity building work on that committee, as well as keeping a pulse of what's happening around the state. Looking now at the core service area of research for us, between January 1 and December 1 of 2020, MCA DSV staff fulfilled 1,605 technical assistance requests from advocates at member agencies. That resulted in staff providing 807 hours of research and intensive technical problem solving for those requests. We also distributed 71 publications related to those TA requests with the most popular being the resource writing policies and procedures. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that comes as no surprise to anyone, as we know this year was filled with writing and rewriting policies and procedures as a way of responding to the pandemic. And you all really rose to that challenge. MCA DSV staff also conducted a COVID-19 needs assessment of member agency staff and the services you all provide through a mix of surveys, regional meetings, uh, communication with our regional liaisons, and also direct contact with advocates at member agencies. This info that we gathered was really important to be able to share with our federal and state partners and funders in our public policy advocacy. We also took this data and we shared it as part of our media advocacy to really help elevate exactly the sort of work that you all are doing, the life-saving, life-changing services you provide to your community. We wanted to capture that and highlight it out in our media advocacy so that more Missourians know about the really vital services you provide to your community every day. And now with public policy. I wanted to really focus our public policy update on providing a legislative update on Senate Bill 569. There are three really important elements of this bill that we wanted to make sure we shared out with folks. One is that it now calls for a system enhancement to track, store, and maintain confidentiality of rape kits. It requires participation in the rape kit tracking system to be mandatory for all healthcare providers and allied officials, such as the individuals who work at the crime labs who are doing the testing, as well as law enforcement officials. So really providing a wraparound way of making sure that everyone is participating in the process. It also makes sure that survivors have access to secure web-based systems for rape kit tracking and status reports. And we're very excited to see these system enhancements coming through in the future for us. Senate Bill 569 also established the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. The really important piece that we're proud of and we know that advocates at member agencies are proud of is that this now grants sexual assault survivors the right to consult with a rape crisis advocate during an exam or interview. And lastly, something that we're incredibly proud of is that there will be a statewide telehealth network to be established for sexual assault uh, forensic exams and training for nurse examiners. This section of law directs the Department of Health and Senior Services to establish that telehealth network. And it also requires the department to produce an annual report on the number of exams performed by hospitals, the number of rape kits completed, and the number and reasons for instances when an exam is not performed. That is really important data collection for us as a state as we continue to work towards building a strong statewide infrastructure for sexual assault response and recovery. And now to highlight some of our systems change work. 
As I had just mentioned, in our ongoing efforts to build that strong statewide infrastructure for sexual assault response and recovery, we work very closely with our allies in the Attorney General's office. Through their statewide sexual assault kit initiative, they have sent approximately 1,500 sexual assault kits for testing. That has resulted in 25 CODIS hits. CODIS is the combined DNA index system that is maintained by the FBI. A quick note on that, the Missouri hit rate is much larger than the national average, and we wanted to make sure that that's not considered the norm. Yet it is notable because that is such a high number, and this is a really vital step in our state being able to identify and catch serial offenders of sexual assault. Another really exciting thing to come out of the Attorney General's office is that they've been awarded a second three-year Saki grant to continue to move this work forward, and we will continue to work alongside them through that process. Another systems change effort that we worked on this year to highlight is our work with the Department of Social Services Children's Division Child Fatality Review Panel. This panel is a subcommittee of the state's fatality review process, and it's comprised of representatives from multiple disciplines involved in child well being. The work that occurred this year was reviewing previous year's cases. They're read and reviewed as a way of identifying recommendations to reduce child fatalities. Some of the folks involved alongside MCADSV were individuals from Children's Division, Probation and Parole, and other allied professionals really working to get to the heart of how do we increase community awareness around these issues and how do we make sure that we are reducing the risk for child fatalities across our state. I also want to highlight our innovation. These are two things we are incredibly proud of and that set us apart from many other state coalitions. So one, coalition manager. Hopefully you all are very familiar with coalition manager now. It's where you go to enter your monthly service reports and outcomes. It's where you go to register for trainings. It's where you go to have access to all of our technical assistance publications for download. We are so excited to announce that it is being used by 31 other state domestic violence and sexual assault coalitions. Additionally, it is being expanded out into child advocacy center coalitions with five of those states coming on. The other thing that we are incredibly excited about is the launch of VILA. We have long heard the frustration of advocates at, Mar at our member agencies as they've attempted to modify existing databases to meet the range of reporting requirements that you all have. And so we worked with advocates at member programs and our partners at Element 74 to develop VILA, a database that is developed by advocates to meet the needs of advocates. And it has been built to encompass features that all of you have said you really need and no other database was able to deliver. We're incredibly proud to be able to offer this to you all, and we're incredibly proud to have been able to partner with you all to develop it. Lastly, I wanna give a big thank you to everyone who is participating on the call today, to everyone who is going to be listening to the call later on for all of the life-saving and life-changing work you do every day. 2020 has been a strange year for all of us. And so if we look down in the bottom right corner, we started out the year in February with Capital Advocacy Days. We had a great number of advocates join us this year for Capital Advocacy Days. We were so excited about it being our 40th anniversary and the work that we can accomplish. And a pandemic hit. And it was referred to as the Corona session because we couldn't have the full legislative session. We had two special sessions. And we just had to roll with a lot of unexpected things coming at us this year. If we look up at the top picture of our CEO, Colleen, our public policy director, Jennifer, and one of our board members, Jessica Hill, they participated in the first ever national virtual advocacy day through our partners with the National Network to End Domestic Violence. We're really proud of being able to be nimble and flexible and meet with our uh, federal delegation virtually and 
proud of the fact that we are still able to bring the needs of Missouri service providers to our federal delegation, even if we couldn't be there in person. And now if we look down at the, the bottom picture over towards the left, you see our staff uh, featured here. We've been running a series of, uh, um, of pictures on our social media called Mask Up Mondays. That's where our staff put on our mask, we mask up and show that we are all still in this together, even if we're working from home. In the midst of a public health crisis, it's still really important for us to stay connected and to promote the values that are so near and dear to us. And one of that is being able to care for one another, to show that wearing a mask is something that is a way of providing respect and caring for each other in this work. Um, and we're also engaged in a lot of civic engagement campaigns that we're trying to expand out into. So you can see us showing off our I Voted stickers as well. Even in the midst of this pandemic, we've worked really hard to stay connected as a staff, as a coalition. And once again, I just wanna say thank you to you all for the work that you do and onward to what we can accomplish in 2021. I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Heidi and Heidi is going to talk with us about our 40th anniversary celebrations. A really quick thing, uh, just to jump back before I turn it over to Heidi to something that Cheryl mentioned. Um, I want to just make sure that everybody on the call today knows we are your coalition. You can reach out to us at any point for anything that you need. Definitely call us, send us emails, write to us through the website, reach out to us on Facebook there and on Twitter and our other social media platforms. We wanna make sure that you all are well connected to us. So our number is 888-666-1911. We love to hear from you and we wanna make sure that you are well connected to us in this time and moving forward. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi. Thank you so much, Matthew. How do I follow that up? Like how, really? Thank goodness I have prizes. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna share my screen. This year we, because of the pandemic and everything, we all were trying to focus on making sure that everybody was connected. And so, I'm sorry, I gotta move stuff around because I can't see what I'm supposed to be saying. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for participating in our MCADSV's first Spirit Week on Facebook. With this year being our 40th anniversary and we were not able to celebrate physically together at conference, we decided to bring some celebration to members via our Facebook. So we had four days that members could share memories and a look to the future as well. So we had our Momentum Monday, which in, was inspired by our desire to further the DV and SV movement in Missouri. We wanted, we wanted you to share with us what excites you most about the future with MCADSV. And then we had our theme song Tuesday, what was your empowerment song or a song that reminds you most of MCADSV? Then we had Wacky Wednesday, which was what is your favorite iconic look from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, or another past decade? And then we all always have to have the classic of Throwback Thursday, which was pictures from the past of MCADSV conferences, such as your old name tags, conference swag, or, or programs or memories of previous conferences. So each person that posted a comment each day received a spot on our wheel because you know, in this moment, we love wheels. And we will have four spins, one person and one agency will win one of the four prizes. Um, the person that the wheel lands on will win MCADSV swag and the agency will win the 40th anniversary swag that are pictured here. So let's get the spin in. 
So now that I've moved everything, let's see if I can find my web page that actually has the site on it. There we go. All right, is everybody ready? We had a lot. If you can tell, there are a lot of names in, in this wheel. So the first spin of the wheel is Regina Shelton of YWCA. She's going to win a t-shirt and the Y is going to win the MCADSB swag of 40th anniversary. All right, our next one will be a hoodie. And that's gonna be Emily Stowe of Alive. So Alive will be receiving uh, their 40th anniversary swag as well. The third one is a tumbler. Ooh, it looks like it's Latasha from CASA. We'll be receiving that and CASA will be receiving their swag as well. And the fourth one is my favorite, it's the socks. That will be Phoenix from Safe Connections, yay! All right, I'll pass it back over to you, Matthew. All right, thank you so much, Heidi. I wanna give a big shout out to Heidi and all the folks who serve on our wellness crew here at MCA DSV. They came up with the idea for the Spirit Week and it was such a really fun way of keeping folks connected and engaged. So I appreciate y'all for putting that together and I appreciate all of you who participated this week. Um, I'm going to give a quick shout out to Kim Kemp because I see you on the call. The picture that you posted of your big perm tear was phenomenal. <laughs> so a big thank you to all of you who participated in that this week. I do want to now open it up to see if we have any questions. So now is your time to ask questions of MCA DSV staff, if you have any comments. Uh, if you have any other stories that you just want to share from the, from the year, um, we're now turning it over to all of you. So feel free to unmute or write in the chat. Matthew, there is a, a question in the chat. Is there a way we can order a hoodie? That is a great question, Taylor. And yes, you absolutely can. I'm actually going to ask Natalie Smith, our office manager, um, if she wouldn't mind answering that question. Hi, Taylor and everyone. Uh, yes, you can either go to our website and go to the bottom of the page to our MCA DSV store um, to order merchandise, or you are always welcome to email me directly and I will add my email address to the chat. Um, you can order that way. Thank you, Natalie. I also want to go ahead and give a plug for the socks. They are amazing socks. I don't even get to wear mine anymore because my husband has taken them, so. Mine are consistently in the wash because I wear them a lot. They're very festive looking. Yeah. They're technically Christmassy, they're kind of Christmassy. I did discover this week, however, that they are not immune to having one of them go missing somewhere in the land of the laundry room. So just as an FYI, they are real socks. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments, things that you all would like to share out? All right, well, I am going to wrap this up by once again saying thank you to all of you. Thank you for the work that you do every day. Thank you for being on this call with us. 
and uh, happy holidays to you all and onward to 2021.